Good Friday morning, end of the work week. So I hope today uh, with your study, it will just take you a little further, and I hope each day it encourages a little more. We are looking right now at Exodus chapter 20, and we're looking at the Ten Commandments. And we've already gone through the, the first nine, so now we're doing number 10. And really what I find out about the, the Ten Commandments, it tells me how short we fall to where God would want us to be. And it really makes us appreciate His grace. So we're going to look at number 10 today. And number 10 today says this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You will not covet his house. You will not covet his car. You will not covet his swimming pool. And we can go through the list as we bring it up in the more modern things in modern times. So what is coveting? Um, the Jewish word is hamid, H-M-D, hamid. And what it means is desiring, wanting, craving. We put it on our mind that we need to have this thing. Now please understand, there's nothing wrong with working hard and having things. There's nothing wrong with that. But in this case, you just have to have a desire to have it so bad that it just it consumes you. All right? And we're told not to covet. There's, an, a, there's a, in a, a, a terrible effect that happens when we dwell on some of these things. Let me give you more of an example you'll understand. All right? David, King David, that Scripture says is a man after God's own heart. David is in the palace, and he looks across, and he sees uh, Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, bathing. And he dwells on it, and he thinks about it, and he covets Uriah's wife. The next thing you know, he has her come to the palace. He commits adultery. She gets pregnant. And he has to hide it. He does not want to be accused of it. So he brings Uriah in from the battlefield and says, hey, you're doing a great job. I want you to have a few days off. Uriah says, no, I will not come home yet while my men are still fighting and sits on the doorstep and refuses to enter his house. So David has to come up with another plan because he doesn't want to be accused. He doesn't want to be found out that it was him who got uh, Bathsheba pregnant. So he goes ahead and he sends Uriah back into the battlefield. And he tells the commander, he says, tomorrow morning have Uriah lead the charge and give all the men orders to fall back. So he sends him in and actually makes sure he gets killed. So he went from coveting to adultery on to being a murderer. Here was a man after God's own heart. And see what it did? It destroyed his relationship for a long time. Until he repented and repented and repented and got right with God again. It tells us uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 19 through 21. And we can just take covet and we can put in the word jealousy. All right? Because they're pretty much the same thing. And it says this in 19 as we pick up. And again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God and Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. This is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. In verse 20 then, For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Lest then I come, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many of you who have sinned. And so what he's saying is through, co through their coveting, there would be jealousy, there would be fits of rage, there would be selfish ambitions because they covet. He goes on to say, before have not repented of your uncleanliness, fortification, and lewdness, which you have practiced. 
So again, what happens when we covet? Well, we put the world ahead of the kingdom. The things that we should be dwelling on, the Christ-centered things, we're dwelling on the things of money, of ownership, of passions, things that we dwell on, we're coveting them instead of doing what we're called to do. Matthew 6, 24 tells us, no one can serve two masters, for either we will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And we see this word mammon all the time. People say, they ask me, Pastor Stan, what does mammon mean? Well, mammon can be a lot of things, okay, not just one specific thing, but I find this is probably the best definition of it. Mammon is a noun, of course, and it says this, wealth regarded as an evil influence or false object of worship and devotion. Isn't that what happens when we covet? It was taken by, by medieval writers as the name of, listen to this, the devil of covetousness. So what happens is when we covet, the devil, Satan, is controlling our minds. And when you find yourself doing it, cast it aside, repent, point your eyes toward Jesus. Amen? We will finish. We'll wrap it all up tomorrow. I hope you got a lot out of this study today. Heavenly Father, again, we praise you and bless you. We thank you and we glorify you. We ask, Lord God, that we do not have a heart of covetousness. We do not have eyes of covetousness. And we do not have a mind of covetousness. That, Lord God, we are thrilled with what you have granted us. We live in the greatest country of ever in history. And the things we have is such an abundance. We should not want for anything because you have blessed us with everything. But most of all, you've blessed us with salvation, with eternity through Jesus Christ. And we are very thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I will see you Saturday morning. God bless.